It was the largest wolf ever to walk the earth. A fierce, powerful, and tenacious predator. The dire wolf killed to survive in a savage ice age world. Hunting in packs, the dire wolf was one of the most imposing predators on the Pleistocene landscape. of wolves methodically orchestrated kill after kill. But suddenly, in an instant of geological time, they vanished. In a world where might made right, the powerful dire wolf perished, while its smaller, weaker cousin, the gray wolf, somehow survived. Was the dire wolf unable to satisfy its savage hunger, or did some overwhelming force drive it into oblivion? Los Angeles, home to the dog-eat-dog -dog world of Hollywood movers and shakers. 10,000 years ago, a different kind of predator walked these streets. It was the end of the Ice Age, the era called the Pleistocene. The last of the glaciers were receding, and an extraordinary assortment of mammals walked the Earth. Not since the age of dinosaurs, 65 million years before, had so many animals of such great size and strength roamed the North American continent. There were sloths the size of bears, mammoths standing more than 12 feet tall. Feeding on these monsters were the hypercarnivores, killers like the giant short-faced bear and the saber-toothed cat. You step out of your time machine 10,000 years ago in North America, is going to be a furry nightmare. This is the world of the dire wolf, a massive dog-like creature that hunted and killed in huge packs of 30. A tough, fierce meat eater, it could take down prey 10 times its size while fighting off much larger predators. Like a street fighter, it was clawing for its share of the Ice Age world. You just can't be eaten down because you just have the endurance and the stamina and the ferocity to scare or exhaust the opponent into submission. Its tenacity helped the dire wolf survive for more than 100,000 years. Yet today, all that remains are its bones. The remnants of thousands of dire wolves have been uncovered here at the La Brea Tar Pits in the heart of Hollywood. This black cauldron is a paleontologist's dream. Discovered more than 100 years ago, the Tar Pits is the greatest repository of Ice Age bones in the world. More than a million bones from 231 species of prehistoric animals have been unearthed. What makes this area so unique is naturally occurring asphalt. This black, syrupy material not only beautifully preserves the bones, it created one of the most deadly animal traps ever known. During the time of the dire wolf, molten asphalt oozed its way from thousands of feet below the ground. As it reached the surface, it cooled, forming a harmless black crust. But in the heat of summer, this crust melted, the asphalt turning back into a sticky syrup trapping any unsuspecting animals that wandered into the area. This explains why more than 200 individual horses and 300 bison have been found in these pits. But outnumbering the herbivores by a surprising rate, almost 10 to 1, are the predators. This is the opposite of what we find in nature. Normally, herbivores outnumber predators by 10 to 1. Scientists believe opportunistic predators like the dire wolves would attack what looked like an easy prey. But quickly, they too found themselves trapped by the asphalt. This happened countless times over the centuries. Predator and prey trapped in tar, their blackened bones all that remained. To most, this is simply a jumble of bones. But to an expert's eye, they represent a map showing us the paths these creatures walked in life and the road they took
to their deaths. 15 feet below the surface, corresponding to approximately 40,000 years ago, are bones from various animals, including the dire wolf. The quality of preservation is excellent, and the diversity that we have found within this site is second to none. Right here, exposed at the bottom of this one grid site here, we have a vertebra of a short-faced bear. And right here, we have a dire wolf humerus, which is the upper arm bone, with nice juicy asphalt coming off of it. After researchers carefully uncovered, cleaned, and pieced the bones together, they found the largest canid, or family of dogs, that ever lived. The wolf averaged five feet from nose to tail, stood just over two feet tall, and weighed up to 150 pounds. In Latin, it's called Canis dirus, but it's better known as the dire wolf. The name dire is fitting. The name evokes a menacing predator looming on the horizon. It is by far the most common species to be found at the La Brea excavations. More than 3,500 individual wolves have been uncovered. By comparison, there are just 2,000 saber-toothed cats. Experts believe the large number of dire wolf bones proves they were social animals, perhaps running in packs of 30 or more. They also suggest the dire wolf had a special talent for survival. Compare 3,500 dire wolves to just 15 of their closest Ice Age relatives, the gray wolf. The dire wolf had been dominating the gray for hundreds of thousands of years when the dire wolf suddenly disappeared. Yet it was the gray wolf that survived. The anatomy of the two species reveals why. Anatomy is often destiny. And anatomy often tells a story about what actually worked for an animal or for a species for a long time. And the anatomy of the Pleistocene mammals gives us very good pictures of Pleistocene behaviors. At first glance, the anatomy of the two animals is nearly identical, suggesting they acted much the same. But when we take a closer look, we find small but crucial differences between the two. The most distinctive difference is the dire wolf's larger jaw and teeth. Paleontologists believe this would have created a much stronger bite, adapted to bring down the larger Ice Age mammals like bison and horse. Researchers compared other bones and discovered other important differences between the two species. The humerus, or upper arm bone, of the dire wolf, for example, is slightly longer, but significantly thicker than that of the gray. So too is the ulna, or one of the two lower arm bones of the dire wolf. That means the dire wolf was a more powerfully built animal, weighing up to 70 pounds more than the gray wolf. The lighter gray wolf bones suggest it was sleeker and probably more fleet of foot. These differences are subtle but significant and likely transform these similar creatures into very different hunters. Every animal has a style of attack which is determined by its physiology. Bears use their size and strength to overwhelm their prey. The cheetah has its speed and agility. The lion, its powerful claws and suffocating bite. The wolf has only two weapons, its weight and its mouth. In both cases, the dire wolf held the advantage over the gray. But by how much? To find out, we turn to another member of the canid family, the dog. Joe Camp is an animal coordinator for film and television in Los Angeles. Lauren Williams and Brian Hill are professional dog trainers with eight years of experience teaching dogs to guard against intruders and attack on command. Its powerful bite, together with its robust attack style, probably allowed the dire wolf to bring down much larger prey. 
Larger, stronger, the dire wolf was like a gray wolf on steroids. A super wolf adapted to take on the very largest Ice Age giants. Yet the dire wolf was soon to fade into oblivion, while the smaller, weaker gray wolf would survive. Something had learned to hunt the hunter. A top predator had a ruthless competitor. For more than 100,000 years, the dire wolf thrived far and wide across the Western Hemisphere, from Alaska to Florida, down to parts of Latin America. Yet no direct descendant of the dire wolf survives today. During its time on Earth, it was competing with a cousin, the gray wolf. Canis lupus, the Latin name for the gray wolf, was a thousand years ago as it is today. It survived where the dire wolf and so many other large mammals did not. Not only did it survive, it remains a top predator, a powerful, relentless hunter. The physical attributes of gray wolves that allow them to be such effective hunters is their speed and their endurance, their persistence. I mean, they will not quit until they acquire that meal. Every one of these traits comes into play, as wolves often take on animals more than four times their size. Most greys weigh 70 to 100 pounds, while a bull elk, for example, can tip the scales at 600 pounds or more. What wolf hunting behavior is all about, the guiding principle is to kill without being killed. Prey are dangerous and can kill wolves, and as a result, they have to be sensitive to the threat posed by the prey animal they encounter, and they assess that threat. With the risk of injury or death looming at each encounter, gray wolves take advantage of their social nature. Like their long-lost cousins, the dire wolves, the greys use sophisticated pack behaviors to take down their prey. There's six primary stages that they go through starting from the time they set out to go searching for prey to the time they actually grab and kill the animal. And so it begins with searching or traveling. This is say if they encounter a herd, then they'll begin to approach that herd. The wolves' greatest assets are their speed and endurance. As a pack, they can outlast almost any prey. So their best bet for a successful hunt is to get their prey running. The pack spreads out and approaches the group waiting for the first of the herd to spook and make a run for it. Predictably, the rest of the herd will follow suit. Elk tend to flee in multiple directions in, in groups. And so you have wolves going in multiple directions, looking through the herd for that vulnerable individual. This is when we can see the distinctive genius of the gray wolf. It has the uncanny knack to spot the one individual in a herd that is either injured, sick, or simply too old to outrun it. When the weak elk is spotted, the other wolves in the pack drop their search and join the pursuit of the vulnerable prey. So maybe you started with one wolf, now that you've got a half a dozen wolves that are running after this elk. Each member of the pack uses its speed and stamina to keep the elk on the run. Relentless pursuit wears the creature down. Then, the wolves close in for their kill. At just the right moment, with the group close behind, the lead wolf attempts to grab hold of the prey. It tries to bring the elk down so the others in the pack can help with the kill. The key hardware that wolves have in their mouths are the canines. Those canines are critical to grabbing and keeping a hold of an animal. So other wolves allow other wolves to go in and bite. The wolf's canine teeth are pronounced and are designed to grab hold of their prey. It's easier said than done. It can mean hanging on to a 600 pound elk as it thrashes about. Sometimes the elk is strong enough to frustrate the wolf's assault. But the determined pack rarely gives up. What they'll do is they'll rally. 
they'll socialize, they'll team up, they'll huddle up, and there'll be a period of excitement. And you'll hear howling, you can hear just near where there's the barking and excitement like that. And then they'll sort of get their courage back up again, and then they'll initiate another attack. Time and again, the pack will engage the herd, searching for another vulnerable elk until they make the final assault. The lead wolf's bite will penetrate the muscles of its prey. The wound will slow the animal down. Then with his grip on the elk secured, the others join in. One animal grabs it and then another, and they all grab on. They're able to, to, to hold it in place. That allows another animal to take multiple bites at it and start biting it and bleeding it and start to eat the animal. Surprisingly, these highly skilled hunters have a dismal success rate, about one in 10, which means they are often on the hunt for their next meal. As for the dire wolf, its physical similarity to the gray wolf suggests it hunted and ate much like its cousin, with one big advantage. The more muscular features of a dire wolf may have provided them more killing power, an ability to physically overpower a prey animal in a way that modern day wolves just cannot do. And in groups of 30 or more, their attack must have been much more menacing. I think there's nothing that's going to be more frightening to a prey species than to see well-organized, intelligent wolves in a large group moving at a high speed with a lot of endurance coming straight after a target that's been specifically selected. Its powerful build and massive jaw and teeth indicate it feasted on the largest of prey, like the mammoth or bison. But it's hard to be certain since the only evidence we have are bones. But recently, new techniques have been developed that can tell us what the dire wolf was eating some 12,000 years ago. It's called stable isotopic analysis and takes advantage of two quirks in nature. The first, due to the fact that most herbivores eat different diets of vegetation, and these different types of plants and environments have different isotopic signatures. These signatures are stored and can be detected in herbivore tissue, including bone. The second quirk is that when carnivores eat these prey animals, these signatures are transferred and trapped in the carnivore's bones. By analyzing the chemical makeup of the meat eater's bones, Scientists can now trace a line from the carnivore back to the prey it ate. That's what researchers have done with hundreds of La Brea dire wolves. We see that they were eating small percentages, probably of things like sloths and mastodons. So about half their diet was bison and about half of their diet was horse. The isotopic analysis determined that while the dire wolf was hunting down dangerous animals like bison and horse, it was ignoring easier available targets, smaller, safer elk and deer. The reason why remains a mystery. Perhaps the large packs were demanding large quantities of food. Were there hidden advantages for taking on large herbivores? No one knows. Either way, the dire wolf went after the most dangerous game it could find, risking life and limb every time. 10,000 years ago, on the prehistoric continent of North America, dire wolves were constantly on the prowl. They put their lives at risk every time the pack began the hunt. Taking on large prey like horse would, sooner or later, bring injury or death to one of the pack. We see it today with the gray wolf, as it carries on the age-old struggle between predator and prey, like the bison. Bison are very formidable, very dangerous. And so in the wintertime, when there's deep snows, wolves can corner bison in areas where they are less effective at defending themselves. But even with a stranded bison, the wolves take special care. These encounters can last days, where they'll have a bull bison isolated on a patch of bare ground surrounded by snow on all sides. And that bison will basically fight to the end, and the wolves will just keep after it. This video shows a battle between a small pack of wolves and a bison that lasted for 36 hours. 
The wolves use their numbers to continually poke and prod, wearing down the giant beast. But the strength and surprising agility of the bison makes it a dangerous adversary. The incidence of injury, we think, is higher with wolves hunting bison. They'll often be kicked off. If the bison continues to wheel about, the bison will throw them into the air. Maybe the bison will hook him with her, his horns and toss him into the air. You see a lot more limping wolves than you do wolves that are hunting elk, and that's likely been sustained from some encounter with the bison. The bison desperately struggles to fend off the pack, but despite injuries to some of them, the tenacity of the wolves eventually pays off. The gray wolf faces this kind of danger every time it hunts for larger prey. It must have been much more perilous for the dire wolf, as it was taking on bigger, stronger animals that were living in larger herds. The dire wolves compensated by pursuing these herds with larger packs. This would have helped, but only to a point. Though the dire wolf ran in super packs, when the time came to attack, the lead wolf was on his own, literally putting his life on the line. The fossil record reflects the dangers the wolves faced every day. Scientists have found thousands of broken dire wolf bones, and each has a story to tell. With a little detective work, we can discover not only the hazards the wolves faced, but the intimate details of their life in the pack. This is an example of a rather serious injury that this animal lived with for a while. This is actually the ulna and the radius, which is this portion of your arm. And a normal ulna would look like so, and the radius would be a separate bone. And what's happened to this animal apparently is it was probably kicked or had some terrible injury which broke one or both bones. And so the two bones are now fused together which probably created some pain for this animal in terms of motion and also some stiffness. A break like this, most likely the result of a kick from one of its prey, would have left it hobbling on just three legs. Unable to hunt with the rest of the pack, it likely survived on scraps of discarded carcass. The fact that this wolf lived for several years is testament to its toughness and something more. It is our first indication of a surprising dire wolf pack behavior. Unlike modern gray wolves, it may be that the dire wolf pack took care of their own. Signs of this unique behavior may also be hidden in this crushed dire wolf skull. This skull suffered some kind of serious trauma and looks very different than a normal uninjured one. Normally, a wolf skull is smooth and symmetrical with rounded eye openings. Compare this with a wolf's skull after surviving a serious blunt force trauma. This wolf was likely trampled by a horse or bison. The blow crushed the skull, dislocated the eye, and caused severe brain damage. But surprisingly, it wasn't these injuries that killed the animal. The significant bone growth covering the wound indicates this wolf lived at least five months after the trauma. In addition, this skull, along with others suffering much more severe injuries, were found in the tar pits. This suggests the wolves died not from their wounds, but by falling into the tar as they hunted for food. The injuries, while not fatal, were too severe for this wolf to have survived on its own. For many experts, this is additional proof that not only did dire wolves live in packs, but they actually cared for one another. However, the scars on this same dire wolf skull show that pack life was not entirely cooperative. In fact, it was a tough, cruel way of life. We have bite marks. Here's one right here. I don't know if you can see that. It's kind of right there. And then there's another one corresponding right here. So this would have been a bite that kind of came around this way. The bite is likely a sign of dire wolf aggression, possibly within the pack. There's a lot of what I call wolf-on-wolf -wolf crime at Rancho La Brea. There's a lot of bites by dire wolves on dire wolves. These marks reflect a behavior often seen in modern gray wolves. There's often a strict hierarchy within the gray wolf pack. The strongest, fiercest male and female stand atop the clan, 
in what's known as the alpha roles. A constant struggle for dominance among the pack can often lead to fierce, sometimes deadly battles. We can see it after a kill when wolves protect their position in the pecking order. Growling and biting are the simplest ways for a wolf to assert its dominance. This same behavior may be reflected here, hidden in the dire wolf bones. It may be evidence that not only was there violence amongst the ancient packs, but that their lives were not so different from the modern wolf. The gap between the dire and gray wolf narrows even further when we consider that certain bones are missing from the tar pits collection. Researchers believe the dire wolves found in the area became trapped while hunting in large packs. If this is true, we would expect to find baby wolves hunting alongside the adults, and therefore a significant number of infant bones in the tar pits along with the adults. Yet, of all the thousands of individual wolves that have been uncovered, surprisingly few are pups. Researchers believe the lack of young dire wolf bones reflects the rendezvous behavior of the gray wolf. During the first six months of a gray wolf's life, it remains in a protected area known as a rendezvous site. The adults of the pack will bring food to the pup until he is old enough to fend for himself. I believe that the dire wolves were in fact rendezvousing their young and that they were not showing up for scavenging or for hunting until they were at least six months old. This probably means the pack behavior of the dire wolf was closely related to the greys. And the parallel between the two species continues to one of the cornerstones of predatory life. The threat from other predators. In the world of the carnivore, the competition over prey is fierce. But once a prey animal is killed, the second equally intense clash over the carcass begins. Stealing a carcass from another carnivore is one of the primary modes of competition among large meat eaters. We see it today among the predators in Africa. And it's been a fact of predatory life for millennia. A predator must learn to protect its kill from scavengers or starve to death. For the modern gray wolf, the worst offender is often the grizzly bear. In Yellowstone, so far, grizzly bears are 100% successful in usurping carcasses from wolves. And wolves very infrequently put up a stiff resistance. They pretty much let the bears take the carcass. Over the years, the grizzly's success has spoiled it. It will often wait for wolves to hunt down and kill a prey, and then take it away. It was likely the same for the dire wolf, facing off against terrifying predators like the short-faced bear and saber-toothed cat. It was a constant struggle to find enough food to keep the pack alive. Most of the time, the smaller wolf would avoid his much larger competition. Most likely, what they're probably doing is, uh, like in, in Enter the Dragon, what Bruce Lee says, the art of fighting without fighting. That's what they're doing. They're trying to compete for some of the same prey resources, but by not actually directly confronting Smilodon, short faced bear, probably working around them. They're competing without competing. But there were times when the dire wolf was forced to confront his larger competition. Unfortunately for the wolf, the rules of nature favor the larger species. In a one-on-one -on -one encounter, the short-faced bear or saber-toothed cat would overwhelm the wolf. This made life for the smaller dire wolf extremely difficult. The powerful predators that roamed the Ice Age terrain tormented them at every kill and threatened to leave them out in the cold. For hundreds of thousands of years in prehistoric North America, the dire wolf risked life and limb to hunt the largest animals it could find. But the wolf wasn't alone. Fighting over the same prey were some of the toughest, most powerful carnivores of the age. The short-faced bear stood nearly 11 feet tall. One of the Ice Age's most intimidating carnivores 
it likely took on even the largest of dire wolf packs. Despite the wolves' aggressive tactics, the bear would have been an almost impossible opponent to defeat. Luckily, the short-faced bear population was small, and encounters were probably rare. However, clashes over food and territory likely pitted the wolf against more common apex predators, like the saber-toothed cat. The saber-toothed cat was a formidable predator, weighing as much as 600 pounds or more. It was fast, strong, and its huge canine teeth made it a dangerous adversary. Individually, the dire wolf was no match against a saber-toothed cat. It would likely turn tail and run before taking it on. But as a member of a pack, it became a commanding presence and would have fought to protect its territory. With its superiority of numbers, the pack would have surrounded a solitary cat, constantly harassing it from all sides. They're most likely in concert in, in a very threatening type of posturing way. A single Smilodon can't be looking everywhere at once. And even though they're all smaller than you, the numbers and the proximity is probably going to suggest that there's some fights that are just not worth having. The cat would eventually break off the attack and search for a meal somewhere else. Time after time, the large pack size transformed the dire wolf from a vulnerable individual predator to a fearsome opponent. And the larger packs gave them another important but subtle advantage over their competition. They could devour their meal quickly. It was a key to surviving the perilous world of Ice Age carnivores. They had to worry about losing their carcasses, and it would benefit them to finish the carcass entirely and eat very rapidly. I think it was a major element, and I think it would have favored very large group size, and it's actually going to enhance the speed at which they can eat. Individually, each wolf used its massive jaw muscles and oversized front teeth to quickly pull off huge chunks of flesh. Its rear teeth were adapted for tearing, not chewing, so they simply swallowed the meal whole. It was kind of remarkable how little chewing went on. They just reach in, mainly with their incisors and the canine teeth, and pull out a hunk of muscle, and down the gullet it would go. Maybe one bite, and then down the gullet it would go. Wolfing down their food, the pack made short work of the kill. They turned a huge bison into bones in just minutes, before another predator could come along and take it away. This was just another of the crucial skills the dire wolf developed to survive among the Ice Age beasts. It became a sturdy, relentless hunter, with the size and strength to overwhelm massive prey like the bison. It learned to work in large packs, to fend off other apex predators. As a result, the dire wolf spread across the continent in large numbers, dominating other species like its cousin, the gray. Then why, after more than 100,000 years of success, did it suddenly disappear from the face of the earth? And how did its smaller cousin, the gray wolf, survive? The question has been hotly debated for decades. Extinction theory is a competitive sport among paleontologists, and the Ice Age in particular is like the Olympics of that competitive sport. The best-known theory focuses on severe climate change, blaming the glaciers that came and went across North America for more than a million years. During these periods of glaciation, experts suspect temperatures in Florida never reached higher than 40 degrees and Southern California looked like the forests and grasslands of our modern Pacific Northwest. Then, about 18,000 years ago, the last of the glaciers receded. The dire wolves watched as their forested landscapes transformed into a moderate, drier climate. Yet unlike the three previous periods of glaciation, they were not adapting as well. I mean, this is one of the oddities of the Pleistocene, is that it's an environment at 10,000 years, and it should be the animals are being more expansive in terms of their range and their resources, and yet they're not. In fact, the changes were pushing species after species into oblivion, even though they had survived several severe climactic changes in the past. Why did all of these large herbivores and large carnivores like the dire wolf manage to survive 
these climatic changes throughout the Pleistocene, and suddenly they become extinct at the end of the last ice age. Perhaps the climatic change at the end of the last ice age was much more abrupt, and that may have played a key role in the restructuring of the ecosystem. One recent theory suggests the reason for this abrupt change. A comet may have exploded over North America 10,000 years ago, triggering a catastrophic extinction event. And the fossil record might support a rapid change. Thousands of dire wolf teeth have been found at the La Brea tar pits. These are teeth that are more robust in size and shape than those of the gray wolf. These stronger teeth mean the dire wolf likely adapted to eating bones more often. In lean times, when food was scarce, they would naturally be chewing on more and more bones to survive. And the more chewing of bones there was, the more cracking of teeth there should be. The kinds of bones that these dire wolves were eating were you know, cow bones and up, very, very large bones that took quite a bit of bite force, and so you might end up cracking a tooth in the process. It's not hard to find a cracked tooth, or for that matter, hundreds of broken teeth among the La Brea fossils. They suggest the wolves were chewing on bones. But they don't shed much light on the extinction episode itself. That is, until we place them on a timeline, when a revealing pattern emerges. Careful analysis shows wolves were breaking their teeth much more often 15,000 years ago than they did 3,000 years later. This is surprising. If the changing climate was killing off the dire wolves' prey, then we should see more and more bone crunching and teeth cracking as time goes on. But the results from the teeth study show just the opposite, that the prey animals were plentiful until the very end. These results support the idea that the demise of the dire wolf wasn't gradual at all, but came suddenly. Recent evidence seems to suggest, based on dating of the last occurrence of these various extinct megafauna, that it did happen fairly quickly, and maybe in a matter of hundreds of years, maybe a thousand years. A thousand years is a short period of time for a catastrophic extinction to occur and cannot be explained by climactic change alone. Something else likely contributed to the extinction. Was it a comet or does the blame fall on man? The beginning of the end for many of the largest Pleistocene animals came around 10,000 years ago. The Ice Age was ending. The frozen tundra was rapidly disappearing from the landscape. The dire wolf was coping with yet another change in climate, and a new and dangerous predator had burst onto the scene. I think climatic change played the greatest role in the restructuring of the ecosystem at the end of the last ice age. But you cannot deny that humans had some impact. Man had made his way across the Bering Land Bridge, and with each step, the end of the dire wolf grew nearer. He may have fanned the flames of extinction. If you look at the last 100,000 years, and especially in this part of North America, the two big 900-pound gorillas that are sitting there occupying that window are ice and humans. They're affecting everything. They're bringing in not just Clovis spear points and fire and large-sized brains, they're probably bringing all sorts of things with them. It's thought man began to excessively hunt and kill the large prey, decimating the food supply for the large hypercarnivore. But the damage may not have stopped there. A controversial new theory suggests man may have introduced deadly diseases into the environment. As humans encroach, and as they bring with them whatever it is they bring with them, they're probably bringing diseases, and most likely those types of infections or microorganisms are affecting everything they come in contact with. And I think that probably knocks out just most of the large species. It is possible that humans took a devastating toll on the large mammals. Add to that a dramatic change in climate, and an entire ecosystem can be forced to adapt. If it happened slowly, perhaps many of the large animals would have survived. 
but the ecological upheaval magnified the shortcomings of every living species. During those last years, the dire wolf was fighting off extinction. The fierce competition from the other large carnivores was getting worse as they clashed over the same diminishing prey. But his smaller cousin, the gray wolf, adapted to the situation. For almost 100,000 years, gray wolves were found in many of the same areas as the dire wolf. But these greys were found in much fewer numbers, around one to 10. The gray had the role of the underdog. It likely maintained its distance from the larger dire wolf packs and focused its attention on smaller prey. As a result, the gray wolf likely adapted into a more agile, versatile hunter. They're highly flexible in their behavior, and that's absolutely essential to their survival. And that largely explains why they've ranged so widely in terms of geographic distribution. The flexibility of the gray wolf can be seen today. They are able to hunt down the largest of prey, like the bison, as well as the smallest, such as rabbits and mice. They have also expanded their menu to include fish. It's helped make them a top predator across North America. As for the dire wolf, it appears size was not everything. As opposed to what humans often think, which is bigger is better, there's often a benefit, an evolutionary benefit to smaller size. And smaller size often means more flexibility in terms of what it is you're doing out in the landscape. The flexibility of the smaller gray wolf allowed it to engage in many types of hunting behaviors. But the dire wolf, for the previous 100,000 years, created large packs and hunted only the largest beasts. When the quickly changing ecosystem required it to modify its lifestyle, it was unable to adjust. Around 10,000 years ago, the dire wolf, along with almost every large mammal of the Pleistocene, faded from the ancient landscape. I think they went extinct because they were specialized for large prey, and the large prey were removed, apparently, by a combination of humans and climate change. The dire wolf had survived more than 100,000 years of vicious competition. It fought off a population of hypercarnivores, the likes of which the world has never seen again. Yet everything that made the dire wolf so successful became its undoing. The sheer strength, massive appetite, and killer instincts that allowed them to take on the world's most dangerous prey, ironically, prevented them from acting small enough to survive. A lesson that any species ignores at their own peril. <laughs>